Hi, I'm Carl Azus, delivering one of two shows we're producing this week before we go on break for the Thanksgiving holiday. Welcome one and all to CNN 10. We start today's show in California's Sierra Nevada mountain range, the only place on earth where giant sequoia trees naturally grow. And forest scientists say some of these very trees have been alive for thousands of years. Before uh, ancient Rome, before Christ, I mean, these trees were, were mature. One big reason why many have survived that long is because in the past, they've been able to withstand the wildfires that are common to this part of the world. Their 200 foot high canopies stretch above the flames, their thick bark protects them close to the ground. And milder fires actually help these trees reproduce because the heat causes their cones to release new seeds. The problem is the size and intensity of some recent wildfires in California have been overwhelming for thousands of giant sequoia trees. The giant sequoia that was first weakened by drought was then subject to impacts by the bark beetle, which then further weakened the tree and potentially made it more susceptible to mortality from fire. Conservationists have seen hope on the forest floor with many baby giant sequoias sprouting up in the months after the fires. And there are some steps people can take from controlled burning of forest vegetation to the removal of other trees and brush to protect the mature sequoias of the Sierra Nevada. But a conservationist interviewed by CNN and the Denver Channel says the restoration work that needs to be done would cost billions, and in the meantime, the danger remains. We're on a hike in the Sierra Nevada mountains. But this is a tour of sequoia destruction. I'm not happy about 2,000 to 3,000 more dead large sequoias. It's a big number to me. That's three to 5% of the remaining monarch sequoias in the world, according to a preliminary report by the National Park Service, killed in the KMP complex fire that churned through Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks and the Windy Fire further south. And that big number is on top of an even larger loss of mature sequoias last year in the Castle Fire part of the Sequoia complex, that wildfire eviscerating 10 to 14 percent of the world's giant Sequoia population. Brigham says this means in just the last two years, up to a fifth of mature Sequoias, trees that have stood for at least a thousand years, if not more, have been lost to wildfire. It's a conflux of concerns these scientists never thought they would see. The threat made worse by another year of drought, leaving the Sequoias dry and vulnerable. That means its water source has been there for over 2,000 years. That that water's not there means that the climate and the world around it has changed. But lessons learned last year helped save some sequoia this year. Before the Castle Fire, we had never seen losses of large trees like we had in that fire. 7,500 to 10,600 large sequoias lost in a single fire event. And that really changed what we decided we were willing to do to protect trees if we could. And what they were willing to do called for innovation in the face of fire. From literally throwing what they could at the threat, like sprinkler systems that spray trees 35 to 40 feet in the air, and dropping fire retardant gel from aircraft into hard to reach groves, to extreme tree hugging, swaddling some of the world's largest trees, like General Sherman and General Grant, in structure wrap. We had hand crews going in and doing this kind of raking and fuel removal around individual trees in groves. We did backfiring operations to change fire behavior. But the loss of any sequoia, such rare and majestic beauties, is one too many to lose. It is dead. That tree is dead. It is not coming back. This tree that is at a minimum a thousand years old and has survived many, many, many previous fires and should have lived another thousand to two thousand years is dead, is gone. Stephanie Elam, CNN, the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Ten second trivia. What do Hermes, Icarus, and Vesta have in common? Are they all car models, characters in Greek mythology, asteroid names, or tire brands? Vesta was a character in Roman mythology, but these are all the names of asteroids. There's another one named Didymus zipping through space. It has its own tiny moon, what NASA calls a moonlet orbiting around it, 
and that moonlet will be the target of a new NASA mission. It's called DART for short. It includes a spacecraft that's set to launch sometime between this Tuesday night and February 15th. It's scheduled to near Didymus' moonlet next fall, and after it does, the plan is for a spacecraft to smash right into it. Why do this? The goal, astronomers say, is to nudge the moonlet. The Planetary Society says if all goes according to plan, the collision will push the moonlet slightly closer to Didymus and shorten its orbit around the asteroid by a few minutes. You can think of this as a type of high-tech science experiment taking place almost 7 million miles away. Estimated cost, somewhere around $320 million. Here's why NASA's doing this. It's a space story seen several times in the movies, like in the 1998 sci-fi film Armageddon. The United States government just asked us to save the world. Anybody want to say no? An asteroid threatens Earth. The military, astronauts, even oil rig drillers try to save mankind. Some cities don't make it, but in the end, the planet survives. A Hollywood ending which NASA is hoping to make a reality with its first planetary defence test mission. Scientists say they have identified the kilometre-wide asteroids like those shown in the blockbusters and there are no dangers of them hitting Earth in the coming centuries. But NASA says it wants to study what could be done if an Earth-threatening asteroid is discovered. On Wednesday, it will launch a mission called DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, that will send an unmanned spacecraft into space and, if successful, it won't be returning home. DART is set to launch aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and will travel through space for the next nine months. Its destination, a near-Earth asteroid named Didymus and its moonlet. These asteroids are not a threat to the Earth. They are not a danger to the Earth. They are not on a path to hit the Earth in the foreseeable future. That makes them appropriate target for a first test. Travelling at a speed of 6.6 kilometres a second, DART will then deliberately crash into the moonlet to try to jolt it from its regular orbit. Scientists back on Earth will monitor the collision using satellite imagery and ground-based telescopes to see how much the moonlet changes course. If one day an asteroid is discovered on a collision course with Earth, then we have an idea of how big that asteroid is and how fast it's coming and when it will hit, that kind of information, then we will have an idea how much momentum we need to make that asteroid miss the Earth. The targeted moonlet is a little larger than one of the pyramids in Egypt. NASA says there are 10,000 known asteroids that are just as big or bigger that could potentially cause major regional damage if they ever hit the Earth, although none of them are tracking this way. DART's kamikaze mission could provide life-saving data if anything ever does get too close. A new auction record has just been set for the most money ever paid for a book, printed text, or historical document. And the historical document that set it is a rare copy of the U.S. Constitution. The original was handwritten and not for sale. You can see it at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. But of the 500 copies that were printed in September of 1787, just 13 of them are known to survive. And this one was estimated to fetch between 15 and 20 million dollars. However, after a bidding war, the CEO of an investment company won the auction with a 43.2 million dollar bid. He reportedly plans to loan it to a museum. Not every executive would have the power to spend that. Not everyone with the money would have the Constitution. Is the sale a preamble to more auction records? Those can always be amended and documented, and this one will be preserved for posterity. It makes sense, though, that the record would set a record. It's fitting for one of the oldest surviving documents of the oldest surviving governing document. I'm Carl Azus. West Morton High School gets today's shout out. It is great to see you, our viewers in Berwyn, Illinois. We have one more show to go before we're off for the Thanksgiving holiday. <laughs>